Patriots family, I want to tell you about an incredible discipleship resource that we have available for you right now, Jude Kept for Jesus Christ, the 40-day devotional by our very own Pastor Ryan Britt. As you know, we're getting ready to head into this two-week series through the book of Jude, and this devotional will not only be a great companion for that series, but it will guide you through the rest of 2022, and we're asking God that he would deepen your faith through this. If you want to get a copy, you can download it for free right now at coe22.com slash Jude, or you can purchase a physical copy just like this one by going to that same website or at any of our campuses around Jacksonville. Our prayer for you in this season is that you would grow to love Jesus more as we study the book of Jude. Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. All right, gentlemen, we are back. We are going to jump into week one of this new series through the book of Jude. Super pumped. Pastor Britt bringing the word. Uh, This teaching series uh, on the book of Jude has a particular history for you. So why don't you give us a background on how we got here and uh, what brought you to this study? Yeah. Yeah. The book of Jude uh, is the next to last book in the New Testament. And it's pretty short, but it packs a punch. (laughs) And I was studying uh, in college. I I, I would get asked to preach all the time at, at youth camps and youth weekends. And a part of that was like a Sunday morning rally that you would so you'd have this whole weekend with students 6th to 12th grade Friday night and Saturday night you're preaching and teaching and 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 it's like super high energy and then on Sunday mornings it was like can you give a 20 minute like last commission as they go back into their schools or back into their world to so that they would stay focused and so I was studying through the, the book of Jude, which is very much about how to walk out your faith, how to contend for your faith against things that would come against you. And so I, out of the uh, back half of Jude, the last four or five verses, um, which is next week in the sermon series, week two, I wrote this sermon that I probably preached like a hundred times between the time that I was 20 and 25 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't really dig around a ton on the on the front end uh, until, until later. And so all that to say, I've had like a 25-year journey with this book of Jude where God just grabbed my heart with it in college. And I saw God use, so I think the last part of the last few verses of Jude are some of the most beautiful writing in mm-hmm. the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so anyway... That's how Jude came to be a thing in 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 my life, and and so I'm happy to share it with our church. Yeah, I want to mention too that uh, you've written a devo, forty day devotional through uh, the book of Jude called "Kept for Jesus Christ." And man, hasn't, isn't it awesome that we uh, are blessed as a church to get to see God produce some of these discipleship resources? I mean, Pastor Doby, your book, and uh, a little earlier in the year we had uh, Gretchen's devo to get our hearts ready for saturated. Um, man, you can grab those at coe22.com slash store if you want. Um, but I am, I'm super excited about all those things. We're going to jump yeah, in. I, let me just, and I, I appreciate it, man. Jude would be one of the books I am least familiar with. Mm. Like, I don't know. I've taught a lot of Bible. I don't think I've ever preached a message out of Jude ever. Mm. I, I mean, I've borrowed the snatch from the fire phrase, you know, same kind of youth camp thing, go snatch from your hellbound friends from the fire, but... So it's really we have such great teachers uh, on our team that dive in and preach the word, and so thanks, bro. Yeah, yeah man, thank you. I'd, I'd say thanks to you for all of it. Uh, let me teach it uh, at our church, but also the devotional. Uh, that's that's all you're doing, really. In 2020, Pastor Joby uh, asked me to go on sabbatical, take a little break at the end of 2020 to refuel and get ready for 2021, and Going into that, my commitment, one of the things that we committed to was that I would do a writing project, and I didn't know exactly where it would go. I just knew I wanted to write 25,000 what I thought were good words <laughs> on while I was uh, given that time. 
And so not knowing that I would be teaching Jude or where it would ever go, that just is where God led me was mm-hmm. to Jude. And then I thought, I don't know, how cool would it be to do a 40-day devotional through 25 verses? Mm-hmm. Like there's more days in the devotional than there are verses in mm-hmm. Jude. And so there's a lot of days in that thing where literally we just look at one word mm-hmm. and just study that one word and think about that and pray on that together. So thanks to you for asking me to, to do it and giving me the time to do it. And I, I hope it blesses our church. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna definitely find out more about this, but you know, it's a it's a small book with a packs a punch. I think that's what you said. Uh, it's only one chapter, so <laughs> some people might be confused when you say uh, you, when you're talking about the book of Jude, you don't talk about any chapters. So you say Jude 17 or Jude 25 or whatever. So there's only one chapter, and uh, it is written by he says the brother of James, who's also the brother of Jesus. So. Uh, tell us a little bit about the introduction, the background of the book, um, and the author. Yeah, as you've heard Pastor Joby say many times, don't skip the introduction yeah. in the epistles. Yeah, man, all Scripture is God breed. I mean, yeah. it's every word is useful and profitable. And so Jude identifies himself as the brother of James. Almost everything that I studied, they all agree that this is in the New Testament when it gives the names of Jesus' brothers. It's written as Judas or Judah, Mm -hmm. but also Jude is how it would have been translated. And so he is the half-brother of Jesus. And in what I believe is humility, he identifies himself as the brother of of James um, uh, as the author of the book. And he's writing it to a Jewish audience, a Messianic Jewish audience church in Jerusalem, of which he and James became... Mm -hmm leaders in the yeah. in the early church, significant leaders in the early church. Yeah. And, you know, just, you know, really makes me think two on two 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 parallel planes. One, as the brother of Jesus, he had to be there. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, not only did he grow up with him, I don't know how many years apart they were or any of that stuff, but during the P- Passover feast, when Jesus was when everybody is in Jerusalem, when Jesus was crucified, he had to be there. Mm-hmm. And in John 7, there's a time where Jesus' brothers are like, they don't believe mm-hmm. that he's the son of God. Right. I mean, what would it take for you to believe? You do that. You ask that all the time. <laughs> what would it take for you to believe your brother was the son of God? Mm-hmm. And I get that unless he actually is the son of God. Right. right. And what it took for these brothers to believe that Jesus was the son of God is to see him murdered on a Roman cross. Mm-hmm. And then three days later to see him resurrected. Mm-hmm. The greatest apologetic in the world is that my brother was brutally killed, and then three days later, later he wasn't dead anymore. Mm-hmm. That's how these guys became church church leaders, is mm-hmm. that they saw their resurrected brother who claimed to be God and then proved it by conquering death. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. The evidence for the historicity of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is almost to the point where I would say, I don't... <clears throat> I mean, I'm not denying my faith, but... But there's so much evidence. Faith and evidence are not the same thing. I trust that when Jesus died on the cross, it counted for me. Mm -hmm. But it is not a big leap of faith Mm -hmm. to see the evidence of the resurrected Christ. Two books, two letters written in the first century by two brothers who didn't believe and then did believe and gave their life for the sake of the gospel and never denied what they had seen and heard. And we have the account of those two eyewitness testimonies of the resurrection of the one that claimed to be God. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of evidence. Mm. For sure. So the two levels is one, his brothers, his own brothers. Mm -hmm. And then two, what I find fascinating in Scripture is, you know, in Hebrews 2 and Romans 8, the Scripture says that we, that Jesus is our elder brother. Mm -hmm. And so you think about the question, what would it be like for Jesus to be your brother? Well, if you're in Christ, he is your brother. That's right. right. And that should be like a worship-stirring, God-glorifying, affection-growing thing in us. Mm -hmm. You know, I love my brother. My brother's one of my best friends in in the world. There's not much I would do for him, and there's not much he wouldn't do for me. Mm -hmm. However, there are some things. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, would would he die for me? Maybe. For sure. Uh, maybe he would, probably. Would he abandon his family for me? Probably not. You know what I mean? Not that anybody would ever ask him to, but there's some like limitations. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, Jesus, everything do Jesus, my, my superior elder brother, mm-hmm. 
he walked away from all of that mm-hmm. so that I could be his younger, his, his brother. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something to think about. Yeah, and he's not afraid to call us his brother. Right. It's not just us saying, yeah, he's, our, you know, he, he's not ashamed to call us his brother. Um, My well, daddy used to just always say, uh, you know, some, somebody would have some break in town or something good would happen to them, and, and he would just always go, it ain't what you know. It's amazing how gospel that is, mm-hmm. right? Like we, we knock on, this ain't how it works. We, we knock on heaven's door and who is it? And it ain't based on what we know. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm just here with my, with my big brother. Mm-hmm. And based on that, come on in. I'm mm-hmm. with him, man. Yeah, I'm with him. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so that's Jude identifying himself and, and the, the context of the letter uh, as we got into and, and is that there are false teachers mm-hmm. who have crept into the church mm-hmm. and the church is tolerating it and have cultivated an environment whereby they mm-hmm. thrive and they've beginning to, to buy into the lie. Mm-hmm. And so Jude is calling the church to contend for the faith which is to contend for the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ of Nazareth Mm -hmm. and his teachings and his way of life as given witness by the apostles in the first century. We know it now as the New Testament um, and the gospel accounts in the New Testament, but Jude is saying, contend for the faith of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. It's being distorted and twisted, and he uses these terms where he says it's like um, being twisted into sensuality mm-hmm. and and ultimately what these false teachers wanted was to do whatever they wanted mm-hmm. which is to have sex with whoever they wanted to to use money however they wanted to to live life the way they wanted to and they were trying to get everyone else to believe that God's good with that mm-hmm. God's good with a you first you do what you want that if you it, it's really not all that far from the culture that we live in in post Christian America where it's like where you f- you feel a thing, and then that thing must be right and good, mm-hmm. and so pursue that thing. Of course, that's what God wants for you. Mm-hmm. But Jude's like, hold on, man. Yeah. Jesus Jesus said, "There's a better way, and there's God's way, and that your feelings have a place, and they're very informative. They're just not supposed to mm-hmm. be God." Well, I want to back up a little bit before we start talking about the false teachers, because when you talk about doing versus being. And it's intentional, of course, that he starts that way mm-hmm. because before he says, don't do certain things and don't be led astray by teachers who are telling you you can and can't do certain things, he starts off by saying, uh, he calls, he, in the, just the very first line, those who are called beloved. Mm-hmm. And the difference between doing and being really lays the foundation. So get into that a little bit and then we'll talk about some of the specifics about the false teachers. Yes, the, those are two two anchor words for mm-hmm. sure. Calling called is mm-hmm. what Jude writes, and beloved. Mm-hmm. So with called, uh, one is that everyone who is in Christ and mm-hmm. filled with the Spirit of God is called, both to do things, but more importantly and first to be mm-hmm. something or someone. And of all the things that you would give your time to, and all the things that you would do in your life that are good and fruit producing, the most important thing is that you are called, your highest calling is to be loved by God. Mm -hmm. And that all of spiritual growth is the result of you receiving Jesus's love for you and that love transforming you into someone who loves him. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I I love that word beloved. Mm -hmm. We don't use it a lot. You don't walk into your house and be like, Hello, my beloveds. <laughs> it's just not how we are, you know? But I love the be loved. Mm. Your highest call mm-hmm. is to be loved by God. Mm-hmm. And if it, and everything grows out of that. Mm-hmm. Pastor Jeb, you talk a lot about identity precedes activity. So how do you how do you understand that relationship? You know, it's interesting in verse two it says, May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied in you. So this like you're the passive agent there. There's something that's going to happen to you. I think the foundation of understanding being the beloved or being loved is the gospel. I mean, think about it. mercy is uh, not getting what you deserve. Peace is found in the person of Jesus Christ. God is love. There may be even this little, like triune. Mm-hmm. Here's what God is doing in you that Jesus is 
on our behalf, shed his blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, Mm -hmm. that peace is found in the person and the comforter gives us a peace that transcends all understanding and God is love. So Mm -hmm. when the triune God aims who he is at you, then you be, I am that I am, loved. Mm -hmm. And one time Pastor Britt said it in a sermon a long time ago, and since then I've ripped it out, ripped it off to the point where I I can claim it as my own, (laughs) is that we, you and I are not primarily tools in the hands of God. We're not primarily soldiers in the army. We are primarily sons and daughters of Mm -hmm. the beloved King because we're in the family of Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it changes everything, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And so everybody is called to be mm-hmm. the God's beloved mm-hmm. and secured. Yeah. And I love that he says, um, w- w- called, and, and then he says, all four, of the, even your calling and your belovedness is fantastic as they are, they're a means. Mm-hmm. And the, what the means are is that you're kept for Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's the, actually the title of, the title verse that I used for the devotional mm-hmm. because that phrase kept for Jesus Christ it just messes with me in all kinds of good mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. You know that ultimately God for his glory's sake sent Jesus to secure us for himself. Mm-hmm. And that he is giving us as a trophy of grace to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And ultimately we are eternally secure because we didn't earn it, we didn't give it to ourselves, and we're not even kept for our ultimately for our own self. Mm-hmm. What we're kept for by God is for Jesus. Mm-hmm. That all of this is for His sake. Yeah. Praise God for that. Mm. I love the reciprocal relationship between identity and activity because you know it's proven that you will do things based on what you believe about yourself, and that the actions that you do will impact what you believe about yourself. You know, so there is, I think, and I think that applies for sure to what he's going to say here. He's saying, don't do these things because it's not who you are. And if you keep doing them, you might prove something that you don't want to know about who you are. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to the contending part. So that word contending, that's a very aggressive word, contend for the faith. I mean, what, what does that bring to your mind, contend? Guard, fight for, for whatever reason, I have the image of a boxer. Mm. You know that like it's a fight and there's there's an attack. You don't mm-hmm. like contend is not offensive. It, it is defensive in in mm-hmm. that there is an attacker. There's something you're guarding. There's something you're protecting. Mm-hmm. And if and if you don't like some things are going to be subverted. Some people are going to be mm-hmm. destroyed. Like you would contend for the safety of your family. You would mm-hmm. contend for the safety of your church. You know mm-hmm. those kind of things. You yeah. would contend for your country. Whatever the thing are things are that you think are important, man. You would go to war. You would fight for them. Yeah. Do you think a lot of people? This is maybe a bad generalization, but you know, there's a lot of Christians I think maybe that are uh, they don't consider their walk with the Lord a contention. A fight, you know, like because we live in kind of a time of comfortable, you know, comfortable Christianity. It's like oh, I just enjoy church, I enjoy what Jesus does for me, and you know that's that's a dangerous place to be if you don't see yeah, it. Yeah, that's as that, that fight. That's that Stolzenitschen line from Gulag Upper Archipelago. Uh-huh. Those who have predetermined that violence is necessary always are stronger in the fight. Mm. And he was talking about the Russian army arresting citizens. And they never, it never occurred to them that they would have mm-hmm. to physically fight. But if you roll up going, we're going to have to punch people, you're going to win. Mm-hmm. We got a whole bunch of people that, had, that, that don't, yeah, they wake up every day like mm-hmm. we're in neutral. We're not in neutral, man. There's an enemy. There are, there are certain people have crept in unnoticed mm. and are trying to condemn, and they are ungodly people. Mm. And they are trying to take us out. They are means of the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy everything good and godly in our church, in mm-hmm. your family, mm-hmm. in our city. For sure. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's a lot. There's layers to contending. And I think part of the kind of – I hate creating categories, but I do think in – especially in the, in the South where we do ministry, where Christianity can very much be a, a cultural, like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. There's kind of, <clears throat> There's people who have been like radically – awakened to, by the Holy Spirit to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Him as King of kings and Lord of lords, who certainly 
sin and struggling or falling their way through life. But if you peel back the layers of their heart, they're like, Jesus is Lord. And they want him to be first in all things. And anywhere he's not, they're trying, they they want to line their life underneath his firstness because of who he is and what he's done, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's like this other kind of Christianity where it's more, it's like these people are contending for a faith. And then there's like people who consume Christianity like it's a product, Mm -hmm. you know? And Christianity is just another thing on my list of things that I consume. And going to church is much like watching a Netflix show, Mm Or, or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I just want so much more for people who would think of Christianity as a as a thing to consume, that that's not God's heart for you. Like Christianity is not something you consume. It's, it is a call to come to life, to yeah, wake up. That, that one it's category different. you're talking about of like the Southern Christian who's not in love with Jesus, it's more like Christianity is just one of the many categories that they contextualize their life by. Mm. You know, like I'm Southern, I vote this way, I drive this, I like these sports, I'm Christian, I'm conservative, I go to, ch- you know what I mean? That's very different than contextualizing the gospel into a context so that people can be radically saved by him and realize that he's the most beautiful thing in all of eternity. These are very different things. So if we're followers of Jesus, we have been called and we are compelled to contend for this faith that was given to us by him. Um, and I have to contend for that faith in my own mind mm. <laughs> all the time. Right. You know, I have to contend for that in my household mm-hmm. as a as a dad and a husband who is committed to the discipleship of my family and raising my daughters uh, to know that they are God's beloved and what that means in all of their walk, that I have to contend against the noise and the voices in this world for their hearts and their minds. I'm contending all the time. I have to contend for it in the marketplace or in culture. Look, man, we don't live in a pro-Jesus, pro-Christ is king world. We don't. It's that ship sailed a long time ago if it was ever a thing. And not that to start off. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree, but I'm just saying But it wasn't a listen. It man, wasn't as hostile as it is now. It, no I, question. There are people at our church, friends that I know that mm-hmm. have been removed from boards because they are covenant members of our church. Mm-hmm. And the and because we have a biblical worldview on all things. Mm-hmm. And so now what has changed like crazy just in the last few years is that a biblical worldview, it used to be desired in our country. Mm -hmm. Then it went to, well, that's kind of silly that you would think that, Mm -hmm. to now that is unsafe and you can't Mm -hmm. play here anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Man, the the words that scare me where it says for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, as I try to read the Bible of, like, not just what is Jude saying to those people there, but I ask myself, like, what has crept in unnoticed in my life? And then how will I notice if it's creeping in unnoticed? Like, how do I get some Mm -hmm. eyes on it, which is what your sermon helps us do. It helps us pay attention to Mm -hmm. ideas and ideologies that are like the air we breathe now. Every song you hear, every show you see, Mm -hmm. every Netflix show you watch, there are some ideologies that are described right here, honestly, mm-hmm. that have crept in unnoticed mm-hmm. and begin to shape us yeah. in this culture, and we have to contend against that. Well, so much of the 1010 life mm-hmm. that we talked about, John 10, Jesus talks about a stranger's voice they will not listen to. Mm-hmm. Ah! Except sometimes we do. That's, <laughs> That's right. right. And there are a lot of strangers' voices that, that make a lot of noise, and they sound... Mm. Good enough, or they qualify into a category of good. But the question's not, is that good? The question is, is Christ first in all things? That's what Jude's getting at. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, and Paul warns Timothy in Second Timothy, like um, there's a, there's a godliness without power, and I think like we see it today. There's like a morality today. Mm-hmm. It just lacks what God calls as good. It right. just actually lacks morals. But like there's a new morality where things are flipped upside down, where evil is called good and good is called evil. And 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 as a church, you gotta contend against that. As a family, as a person, you gotta yeah. war against that. It's fascinating the difference, you know, because back then it would have been there's a lot of strong language in the New Testament against false teachers. I think pro- one, because it's evil, and two, you had to be 
you had to have some very evil intent because you would go in intentionally saying, I'm going to pretend like I'm following and I'm going to make friends with the people I think are influential and then also try to steer them in a direction that I, that I agree with versus what's being, what's being preached. Uh, and then today, the difference is it's so subtle. It's in the voice, like you're saying, the voices that you listen to uh, via the, the shows you watch, the media, the things you read, the people that you're around. I mean, even just the practical things like I remember when I first got married and I, ex- I, I was examining my expectations about marriage and I was like, wait, where did I even get these expectations? And upon reflection, it's like, you know, romantic comedies or something that you watch, you know what I mean? And seriously, they like lay this foundation of kind of what you think is normal life and then there it is. It crept in unnoticed and it, it led to some, you know, discord internally. And... um Man, I love that. The stranger's voice, they won't know. And um, you talked about the feelings being God. So these false teachers, ultimately their message is what you feel you should listen to. Your feelings are God. And that is a relevant topic for for our time today, for sure. Yeah, it's not all that different. I mean, history is on repeat in so many different Mm -hmm. ways. But the two primary messages, Jude writes about the love feasts. Right. And the two two primary messages would have been... Um, one, you can do sex any way you want to do sex, have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want. Mm-hmm. And because that's what they wanted to do. And so they took the teachings of Jesus mm-hmm. and the testimony of the apostles and they began to twist it mm-hmm. to get what they wanted. Mm-hmm. So just it's a subtle shift toward me first, yeah. away from what is God designed and mm-hmm. desires best. Mm-hmm. And then money, how you practice your 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 spending and your money and what not just what they do personally with their money but also the shared resources of that local church what mm-hmm. they do and so um, it's not all that different mm-hmm. than than much of the wolves at work in the in the church today mm-hmm. where the distortions come in today and not even talk about the greater cultural narrative that mm-hmm. is anti gospel I'm talking about people who are hiding in the name of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Distorting the message of Jesus for their own for their own advantage. That's scary stuff, man. That's no bueno. Yeah, and if you look, I mean, as you were as you were going through it, this one verse: "Who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and to not to deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ." I thought about I thought about the enemy in the garden. Isn't that exactly what he did? Mm-hmm. I mean, you want to talk about the grace of God? We were not a thing. Here we are. What do we do to deserve this? Eat, drink, be merry. Only one don't. The enemy sneaks in, creeps in unnoticed. First and foremost, did God really say, mm-hmm. right? And then the the fundamental thing behind it, the reason he's withholding this from you is because mm-hmm. he's withholding. Mm-hmm. Like, if you would just do what you feel like doing, that would be better. This is the lie. And then you see lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life all give birth to sin. Mm-hmm. It It is the same thing because that Jude is contending against, right? Mm-hmm. That people are creeping in, going, no, no, hold on, hold on, you mm-hmm. want this. And this, what what they're teaching in this church is just trying to keep you from being happy, right? Mm-hmm. It's just it's just oppressing you from being the you that your fullest self that you could be. Mm. It's so interesting to use the word pervert because I've been thinking a lot about that word, not for the reason you think, uh, <laughs> but the, the root. So think about the other words that have that same root, and it means it's a reverse, inverse, Converse, perverse, all those things in, involve a turning or an op- opposing. And so in order to have something to pervert, there has to be something good. Yeah. And every perversion is something good that just gets twisted and turned, and that's what that's Satan's MO, man. He just takes yeah, something man. good and yeah. true. What God you, creates God creates Satan counterfeits over right. and over and over. That was the upside-down kingdom. Right. God establishes the kingdom. Satan counterfeits it to make the temporary things important. Yeah, and the what it ultimately comes down to the don't isn't what you want mm-hmm. better than what God wants. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And and you mentioned Jude love, says no. You mentioned love feast that was the early predecessor to communion and there was tons of controversy around it. They would get together it's sort of like a, co- a combo of like a a potluck supper and a communion ceremony and they would get together and eat and they would celebrate the Lord's supper. And there was either people would think, oh, it must be an orgy, because that was you know a, a common religious practice back then, or it's cannibalism. They're actually eating and drinking blood. 
And even with those things, there are times and examples take like the Corinthians mm -hmm. where it got a little outside well, the bounds of what yeah. Jesus prescribed in Certainly communion. Right. And that's what's going on here too. Right. It's that they've turned a, a good thing that given by God to mm -hmm. enjoy him through and turned it into yeah. uh, a bad thing. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, about those two sets of three examples. So he, he, when he dives into the main meat of his message, he's presuming that his audience knows a lot of things because you said it's a Jewish audience. And so he's going to refer to a lot of things, some Old Testament stories, some uh, Jewish, respected Jewish writings that are not in our canon of scripture, like the book of Enoch, et cetera. Uh, how does that encourage us? How, how, how should we read those? Maybe summarize them again, but uh, how should we be encouraged from reading that to understand the historicity of our faith? Yeah, not to re-preach the sermon, but he you, he gives two examples of three, and then mm -hmm. there's like a bonus. Um, and and the two examples of three, the first is testimonies in ancient Israel of times where God's people rebelled against God, mm -hmm. and that that was met with divine justice. And so the first example he gives is uh, Numbers 14. He talks about Israel's rebellion in the wilderness, and then he talks about the rebellious angels in Genesis 6, of which Enoch, just for context, Enoch is a reminder. Enoch would have been like a, a folklore national hero. Mm -hmm. Like he... The Bible says that he walked with the Lord and he was no more, and that has mm -hmm. generally been interpreted as he never died. He just got like he was so faithful unto God, God just took him on to heaven when it Beamed was his yep. when his when it was his time. And so Elijah, Enoch in his writings would have been old and very respected just on the old fact, mm -hmm. um, and passed down through oral history, and then also his testimony of faithfulness uh, would have been highly respected. And so Enoch writes about what Genesis 6 gives an account for in regards to the angels that stepped out from under God's authority mm -hmm. and crossed some serious lines. And then and, and then Sodom and Gomorrah is probably the most familiar of the three examples Jude gives there, which is Genesis 19, where mm -hmm. all kinds of jacked up stuff was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And eventually, for the good of mankind and for the good of culture, God... God Acts in divine justice against Sodom and Gomorrah, in those. So that's the first th set of three, um, and he actually quotes another Jewish writing, uh, the Testament of Moses, mm -hmm. in there as well. Um, and then the second set of three, he goes on. It's not just people who rebelled against God; it's people who rebelled against God and were corrupting others, mm -hmm. trying to draw others into their corruption. Mm -hmm. And so th th that's where he talks about, uh, he says, you walked in the way of Cain. This, these are serious words mm -hmm. in the first century uh, to a Jew. Balaam, which is Numbers 22 through 25, and then uh, Korah's rebellion against M Moses, which is number mm -hmm. 16, which ended in 15,000 dead. And ultimately what Jude is pointing at is there are ancient roots here. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of history right. that if you have forgotten, he actually says, let me help you remember mm. um, the, what, ha, where this road leads. Mm -hmm. This leads to generational devastation in rebelling against God and pursuing mm. your feelings as God. And you know what I mean? And so Jude's, Jude's just pointing to the history of how devastating being led astray like this mm -hmm. is. So, so one of the things the New Testament writers are always going to do is connect what Jesus is accomplishing, promises fulfilled, mm -hmm. to the old covenant promises made. Right. For instance, mm -hmm. in in uh, my Zorn, Jude 5, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of Egypt, stop. Mm -hmm. So the way Jude sees Exodus is that Jesus did it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can watch all the veggie tales you want. Jesus mm -hmm. wasn't born yet. Jesus right. wasn't there. You know what I mean? Yep. So you cannot fully understand who Jesus is if you don't know the context out of which he was born, which mm -hmm. was the covenant with the, mm -hmm. with the people of God, the children of Abraham, mm -hmm. Israel. And so he does, man. He puts Jesus' name there in the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That, and so all the things that Britt just referenced, man, he's like... 
Let me just give you example after example of, you know, like mm. the enemy's been attacking God's people in these ways, and Jesus is the answer. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, particularly to Jewish audiences, it was very common to, to refer to a, a small thing or one word or one name, and they the audience was then going to hear that, and they would fill in all the rest. And Jesus used that, correct. the, the Ramez, and, yeah. you know. A hundred percent. So th- these examples would have been just the same. There was, he would, you know, that's true in, in the Gospels as well. The mention of certain names would have brought to people's minds, "Oh, I know that family. I know that story. I know where they live." So this you know, would be the this would be the intention. Jude writes a letter to the church, right? So you go to church. You don't get to take the letter home. Mm-hmm. So then somebody reads it, and so then you go home and you're discipling your family and be like, "All right, well, you heard the pastor remind us of Balaam." Mm-hmm. What happened with him? They're like, oh, talking donkey, and you know mm-hmm. they so that it preaches and repreaches and repreaches. Mm-hmm. I think that's what they're doing for sure because they know that that's and they didn't have TV and stuff. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're going to retell the stories that have been told and passed down from your forefathers, right? And that you've been hearing in synagogue until you met mm-hmm. Jesus. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it's it's an in, incredible way to teach people because mm-hmm. these continuously reteach the story of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And so Jude's saying. He's using these Watch very out. potent historical examples in the nation of Israel, mm-hmm. saying danger, 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 right? And yeah. and uh, the old, uh, if your car started talking to you mm-hmm. and telling you different examples of bad things that have happened when people text and drive, mm-hmm. every time you text and drive, if your car was like, gave you an example of some tragedy that happened because of texting and driving, you probably... If that happened every time, mm-hmm. you probably wouldn't text and drive. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you're saying. He's like, hold on, man. I never do that. Let's remember some of the bad stuff that's happened. You know, me either. Yeah. It's against the law. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, we mentioned this already, but he his examples show that that me first mentality so often leads to sexual immorality. You know, case in point, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, now, he lists a bunch of different offenses from these, these teachers. Obviously, a teacher is held to a high standard, uh, but... And they use speech a lot, but many of his examples are speech related. He talks about blasphemy, he talks about malcontent, grumbling. Uh, why do you think he goes specifically after so many things that come out of the mouth in his, his examples? Because Jesus says, out of the mouth, the heart, of the, heart, the heart. Yeah, out of an overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm-hmm. And And oh. I think the overflow of the heart, there's something to that because it's like, What's on repeated pattern? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're a, uh, uh, I mean, that's isn't true of anybody, but if you're a p- publicly, a public order, and on consistent broken record repeat is the things that Jude lists, which I think he's given us a list through that stands the test of time. Mm-hmm. That says if these are the things that are coming out of somebody's mouth over and over and over and over and over again. You need to be really reticent if you listen to them or not, especially if they're doing it in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, And so he does. He lists grumblers, malcontents, people who follow their own sinful desires, loudmouth boasters, and people who show favoritism to gain advantage. He says these are five surefire ways. Mm -hmm. Look out for these things Mm -hmm. in somebody's patterns of speech. If they're doing that in the name of Jesus, you might want to be like, eh. Hold that a little suspect. Not a little suspect, a lot of suspect. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like some bring to bring some definition grumblers, uh, people who complain about people who can't defend themselves, right? Or aren't in the room to defend themselves. It's complaining pointed at people. Mm-hmm. And you should be really cautious anytime somebody's trying to build something, especially in the name of God, at someone else's expense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Grumbling was also used to describe the Children of Israel. So maybe yeah. the audience would have heard that too, like grumbling in the wilderness was murmuring. Murmuring, yeah. you know, right. so complaining just about everything. Ankle biting over everything, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. You know, would it so, so much better before? And why'd you do this? And God, I know we do the same thing. We grumble about what God gives us. I mean, you say that all the time. You know, we, we grumble about the thing we were praying for before. You know, they were crying out to God for all those years in Egypt. And then they're like, why did you take us out of here? We don't have the food we want. So right. I want to talk about this false teachers, right? Yeah. and contending for the faith. 
Oh, it's interesting. Every once in a while, I get listed on some list, somebody's list of false teachers. And the good news is, it's usually me and my friends. You know what I mean? So I'm like, these are the best preachers I've ever met. So, um, that man, there is this thing going on right now on the internet and all the social media things where there are all these people that feel like they're the, the self-appointed people that are going to point out all the false teachers. And if you just look at it, everybody's on a list. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know what I mean? Really conservative people, people that I would consider false teachers, everybody in between. So I think there's a real difference between like contending for the faith family. So as an elder pastor and as pastors at our church, it is our responsibility to contend for the gospel mm-hmm. and guard the teaching ministry of this church. Mm-hmm. That's different than like going hunting. And I'm telling you, man, they're, they're, mm. every word said is scrutinized. And mm. you, so you can't throw, away, throw around that false teacher or heresy kind of label lightly, man. Mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, so what, what I love that you do is you, point, uh, you pointed to where Jude pointed out here is, here's what I think. I think there's a bunch of people running a bunch of websites right now, and they heard Jesus preach, and they'd be like, false teacher, he doesn't preach the Bible. They're like, what? But yeah, nowhere in the Bible is there a story about a father whose son leaves and then he comes back and lets him in the house, right? Because mm-hmm. they would say he didn't, he didn't open up the scroll. Mm-hmm. He just made up a story, false teacher. You, you know what I mean? And obviously Jesus could never be a false teacher because whatever he says is, is the Scripture, right? right? And so sometimes people take some, some things like contending for the faith and watch out for heretics in books like Jude, and then they take it to the places the Scripture's never intended to. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jude is writing to the context of a local church and saying, in your church, there are people teaching things that are false in mm-hmm. your church. Mm-hmm. I, I think it... Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think it has to be somebody with the intent to lead people astray. I, I mean, I, I was thinking about this question, like, are there accidental false teachers? For I mean, sure. Somebody could be mistaken and they could say something wrong. But I think most of the time when the Bible is talking about the false teacher, they're talking about somebody who's doing it on purpose. Right. Right? Do you think so? I mean... Yeah, I I know this. My intent in teaching Jude is to teach Jude. Mm -hmm. Right. And and to be as faithful as I can with it and not necessarily point at what anybody else is or isn't doing. To me, God has given me the opportunity to pastor this church in this house right. and to shepherd this flock. And I think having good doctrine that is gospel-centered, Jesus first, in line with the message of the Old Testament prophets and the witness of the New Testament that believes in the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, that these things matter. And that I want our people to hopefully read Jude and hear Jude and be more equipped to contend for the faith in whatever environment that they would, and and to be able to discern good doctrine that's healthy and holy and God honor. You know what I mean? Like yeah, for sure. It takes a real maturity to be able to divide between like that person is saying things that are different than my personal preference of the way I like church, and that is not in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, for instance, one of the things that I just don't really put up with at our church is when people come and to meet me and then tell me the church they came from and begin to badmouth that church. Mm-hmm. I just go, we don't do that here. We're not going to do that here. Now, hopefully, we lift up Christ, the cross, and the gospel so much that if they do go to another church one day or move or listen to something online, that they would so know the aroma of Jesus, they could go, that doesn't smell right. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's wrong there, but that doesn't sm- Pass the sniff test, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, when he, you're talking about that list in verse 16, grumblers, malcontents, etc. You talked about in your sermon another list of uh, things to do that I think complements kind of that, like or sort of the opposing uh, group for that list. So just briefly touch on those again. What What are those things that you want us to leave with? I think contending for the gospel in the spirit of Jude's writing, whether it is in your own mind, in your family, in your generational discipleship efforts, in your job, whatever environment God puts you in against the overwhelming 
dominant narrative in in culture as believers, how do we contend for the gospel? I think some things that for us to to put into practice is number one, like Pastor Joby said earlier in Jude writes, remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Preach the gospel to yourself every day, all day. And grow so we remember the gospel. And I love that that I just want to remind us that we don't follow an ideology. That this is not just some statement of faith on a website that we agree with, and it gives us some kind of framework of morality by which to live our life. That is not the invitation of Jesus Christ to follow me. Uh, that we follow a man mm-hmm. who claimed to be God and who proved it when he rose again after being dead for three days. And we believe that he said the reason he died was to pay the penalty for sins because he rose from the dead, that we believe him. And the Old Testament prophets all give witness to it. The history of Israel all gives witness to it. The New Testament eyewitness. So we we follow a man who resurrected. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth from the dead is the centerpiece of our faith. And everything revolves around him. And, and so that's... That's one thing is I want us to remember the actual gospel of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. which is his gospel. Mm-hmm. And so remember the gospel. Let me let me say something to that one. This kind of has this is piggybacking on my own thing I just brought mm-hmm. up. So I'm I'm meeting with some eleven twenty two ers very recently. Love them so much. So when they listen to this, they'll know who I'm talking about. But I love them so much. So I have nothing negative to say about them. But they listen to a pastor that I would one hundred percent put in the false gospel people. I've never said this person's name from stage. I don't think I would do that. But okay. But my challenge to these people was was that this pastor is very positive and very likable and many, you know, these kind of things. And uh, quit trying to figure out who it is. And and I said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go through all the videos, all the things you that you love. Okay. And just just send me a clip of one sermon of the gospel. Just find one like at one point, we're sinners. We're not created in the image of God. We're sinners. Christ came to die for our sin and has called us to repent of that sin, put our faith in him. Just send me that sermon. And if you can't find that in the bazillion hours worth of video on this mm-hmm. particular pastor, you got to admit there could be a problem there, right? See, that's different. That's me trying to shepherd our people. Mm-hmm. And I'm not overly concerned about this these people because they attend this church and they they get a lot of meat here. So, you know, their whole diet isn't just Twinkies. But I think that diet might actually be like rat poison. Mm. So maybe you could ingest a little bit of rat poison and you don't die. I'm not sure how that works. Mm. But so that's what you're saying here is remember the gospel is a really good test. Listen, listen to a bunch of sermons and be like, When's the, when do you hear the gospel? And if you don't hear it, you should pay very close attention to what yeah. you're putting in your ears. You, you could take any one preacher, teacher, church, one week at a time, two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time, and they may be in a series that's more like a, they may be teaching through something that's more practical and sure. helpful. And so I don't want to, but over time, a season, call it a season, if the regular teaching ministry, preaching ministry, is not centered on, and I'm not just talking about in reference to, I'm talking about centered on Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, if it's not centered on Jesus as Lord of all, all means heaven and earth, head and heart, then it is not biblical Christianity, in my opinion. And they like are not death preaching and resurrection, not just all the stories he taught. Not, right, you could say Jesus' name all the time and never talk about the gospel. Life, death, and resurrection, <laughs> right. and lordship. Right. right, life, death, resurrection, and lordship, and all things of Jesus Christ, because of life, death, and resurrection, mm-hmm. and the fulfillment of God's plan since before the foundations of the world, and so. Yeah, man, remember the gospel, the good news that is God is the gospel That's ultimately right. as revealed mm-hmm. to us through the person of Jesus Christ. He is the good news. Mm-hmm. So he's not, a, he's not means to an end of good news. Mm-hmm. Like because Jesus, we get to go to heaven. That's true, and that's really, really good news. But the good news of heaven is that Jesus is there. So it always comes back to Jesus, right? Yep. So remember the gospel, to resist the lie that our faith, we shouldn't be surprised at godlessness or false narratives or even twisting and distortions of the truth in the church. Mm. We can't stand for it, but we shouldn't be surprised by it that our faith has been under suppression and under attack since the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And it's the same lie. 
whether it's in church or out, inside the church or outside the church, it's the same lie over and over and over and over and over again. Isn't what you want better than what God wants? Mm-hmm. Did God actually say? Mm-hmm. Did he? Act, did, so it's the suppression of truth is God's enemy's game, 100%. And the truth is that God is first, God is good, God is love. The truth is the person of God is the truth that the enemy's trying to mm-hmm. trying to suppress. Mm-hmm. So resist the lie. We have a better narrative. We can resist the lie healthy, well, and without fear mm-hmm. because we have a better narrative because we win. That's right. Because Jesus is one. Mm-hmm. So that's how we resist the lie. Uh, third, reject false teaching. Be on guard, man. Mm-hmm. Like your conversation that you were having, Praise God that they're asking questions. Mm-hmm. Like something down in their spirit ain't sitting right. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're like, ah, oh, we probably should ask somebody that may know a little bit more about Bible than we do about this, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's how it started. They said, I know you don't like this guy. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've never met the guy. I'm, he, he seems like the most likable human on the planet. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to get them to mm-hmm. not tickle their ears, but say, mm-hmm. is he making much of Christ crucified? Or is he making much of anything else? That you know. So it's exactly what you're saying, man. Yeah. So reject false teaching. A few questions of which I know that there's many more questions that I'm sure you could ask, but a few questions for us in rejecting false teaching is one: Do they teach the Bible? Mm-hmm. And I'm not just talking like, do they mention the Bible when they're teaching? Mm-hmm. Do they actually teach the Bible? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And again, I'm talking about. Over a period of time, any one sermon, I'm sure you can make this, that, that, or the other. But do they teach th- the Bible? That that if they're not a Bible teaching church, mm. I, I would probably couldn't recommend any friends or people I care about to go there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> two is do they teach Jesus as the only way? Mm-hmm. Anyone who would teach Jesus as a way, or that's not that is false. It's not even gospel. I mean, it, it's maybe somebody's good news, but that is false. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm-hmm. So the exclusivity of Jesus Christ in regards to the way in which people are forgiven of sins and have a relationship with the Father and live in heaven forever, Jesus is... So anything other than that, you know, you should be asking that. And let me um, just give a little warning there. Like, do they teach? Because what a trick is in, the, in this new world is to always ask questions and never have a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus really mean, and what if, and you know, okay? I mean, there's, I just got Rob Bell. That's exactly what he did. For years and years, early on, I read Velvet Elvis. I went, nope, this ain't going good, Mm y'all. And he was the evangelical darling with his cool videos, and they were so cool. But he starts asking questions, and then when people would be like, hey, what are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't long before there is no hell, Mm -hmm. Christ is like an idea, not an actual person. You know, it's those kinds of things. And so pay attention to that. Like, what are you teaching? Not just what are you asking. Hard to contend passively. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you can't just passively ask questions. Correct. Um, that's not contending. What's so, the last one? Do they teach the Bible? Do they teach Jesus as the only way? Um, Jude talks about loudmouth boasters. Mm. Do they spend more time talking about themselves? Mm and about their thing than they do about Jesus, about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Like, do we, Are we talking about God a lot? And is God first? Mm-hmm. Or is God there to help me be first? Mm. So you know what I mean? Like, right. You just got to listen to their language. And then um, do they ever preach the repentance of sin? Mm-hmm. Jesus' primary message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right. And so I'm not saying you got to only preach that word every week, but everything should be calling sinners mm. Lost people who haven't surrendered to Jesus yet and people who have surrendered to Jesus should be on a regular diet of repenting. Mm-hmm. And so do they, do they teach the repentance of sin? So, yeah. um, And that, that would lead to the last one, which is repent regularly. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that for me to presume or assume that I have a, a, an exclusive claim on the truth, I don't, man, but praise God, that's why he gave us the word. Mm-hmm. And I can listen to a stranger's voice with the best of them, I'm sure, um, but God is gracious, and He has multiplied mercy and love and peace to us through Jesus. And because of that, we can return to Him. Hmm. And anywhere we need to, we should. Amen. It's like, uh, isn't it Martin Luther? Christian life is one of daily repentance. 
Uh, so I love those four things. Uh, maybe as you head into the holidays, if you're listening, uh, those would be four reminders for you, you know, to remember the gospel because gospel leaks, uh, to resist the lie of the enemy, to reject false teaching, and to repent. A couple things I want to remind everybody um, before we go. Uh, grab the Devo from Pastor Britt. It's um, available, like I said, cwe22.com slash store. And we talk a lot about sexual immorality in Jude and kind of in this episode too. If you want to dive further into that topic, Pastor Joby, you preached a great sermon in January and the Upside Down Kingdom. And we're going to list the link to that sermon in the notes to this episode. So Pastor Britt, would you pray for us to close our time? I will. God, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that every word of it is inspired by you and that you've given it to us so that we can know you, uh, know what you're like, know what you want, and we can flourish under your authority and rule and reign in our lives um, by listening and obeying. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, wherever they may be, if they're listening, they're studying through Jude with us, God, I just pray that you would bless them with the peace of the kingdom of God and that they would be uh, experience your nearness right now. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us all to see Jesus more clearly Mm -hmm. and to uphold him as more beautiful and to be more committed to who he is and what he's about. And uh, Father, we pray that uh, we thank you that you have made Jesus our older brother and we can trust him. Mm -hmm. And would you help us to do that? Thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. And I pray that you would help us all to grow in our faithfulness to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.